the people I want to surround myself with are those people that smile a bit easier, laugh a bit easier, um, and are, are happy to be vulnerable and open because I think that's where you make the really interesting connections. Welcome to the Humorology Podcast with me, Paul Barros, and my glittering lineup of guests from the worlds of business, sport, and entertainment who are here to share their wisdom and their use of humor with you. Humorology is the study of how humor can dramatically improve your business success and your life. Humorology puts the fun into business fundamentals, increases the value of your laughing stock, and puts a punchline back into your bottom line. Please remember to like, subscribe and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. My guest on this edition of the Humorology podcast is a political pundit and journalist who is well known for sharing her unapologetic takes on the British government. She began her career in the Twitterverse and now has nearly a quarter of a million followers. In addition to providing insightful and thought-provoking political commentary, she has been featured on many political talk shows, including Channel 5's The Jeremy Vine Show, Piers Morgan Uncensored, and as the host of The Table on Byline TV. She is also the co-host and creator with Gemma Forte of the political podcast The Trawl, where they doom scroll the political side of Twitter so you don't have to. Marina Perkis, welcome to the Humorology Podcast. Thank you, Paul. That was a wonderful intro. Well, <laughs> it, it was... my heart. <laughs> well, bless you. It's all just true, though, and uh, I'm a big fan. I, I, I really uh, enjoy your tweets, and I follow you on both sort of Jeremy Vine and that's in on the table. Um, fantastic stuff. But I'd like to take you right back to the beginning, your early years. Uh, when you were growing up, I, I understand that you were from first generation Italian parents. Was humour actually valued in the family? My mother, well, my parents are very strict. So they are Sicilian immigrants, Catholic, um, church every Sunday, you know, no sleepovers allowed. They really made us work. Um, <laughs> but um, it, was, it, was, it was joyous as well. I make it sound awful, but um, there wasn't too much humour. But if I look back now, Mum was very serious. Dad was very serious as well because there was such pressure to to earn money. We didn't, you know, we weren't well off at all. Dad was working all kinds of jobs. Mum did whatever she could as well. Um, so I don't, I don't think humour was a massive feature. But I think for me, Paul, um, I was a real ugly duckling. Let's put it that way. And when you're an ugly duckling, you really have to develop a personality. Otherwise, you're going to struggle through school. <laughs> so I think that's where humour humor became something to nurture and to, to really leverage for me. So, so how did that affect you at school? I mean, uh, would, were you the centre of attention? Did you have what they'd call a show-off gene? No, I, I certainly wasn't the centre of attention, but I, um, I suppose that was the only way I could, you know, get people to, to take an interest in me, I guess. Because I was the very sort of chubby, um, you know, very dark haired, big, thick eyebrows, very much an Italian child. <laughs> and um, you've got to stand out one way or another. And that was my way, I guess, of trying to be sort of dominant and a little bit funny. Well, I, I, you say a little bit funny. So, I mean, how, how old were you when you realised that, that humour could be the way to forge better relationships? Um, honestly, I, I think it's something that's still growing now. I didn't even, I, I think I'm, I'm noticing it more and more and it's not something I've ever tried to be. I just think I'm seeing now that it's a really great way to forge relationships. And I think actually it exposes you because the moment you're happy to put yourself out there and be vulnerable in being funny, I think people see that there is an in and there is a way to connect with you rather than always being a very serious person. I think that's very true. And that's what the whole humorology project is all around, is how that humor can be uh, that bridge between people. Now, humor I'm talking about is the lightness of touch, the, you know, the love, the connection. Uh, but you also talked about your uh, parents being hardworking. Uh, was 
that determination, that resilience of, and, and broad humour forged by their environment and their beginnings? I don't think so. Sadly not. I think my mum and dad had quite a tough upbringing. So we didn't see that much lightness, if I'm honest. What I will say is my dad now in retirement is a far more, he's, he's a much uh, less serious character than he was and he can have a laugh. And to be honest, I think a lot of it is linked to the fact that he makes his own wine pool. He has a good supply of homemade wine. And I think that helps him in terms of like, you know, laughing that bit easier. And so I'd like to think I've probably got a bit of that from my dad. But mum is very serious, very serious person. It's interesting that you, you, you keep saying your mum is a very serious per, mm. uh, person. So what, the family had sort of two sides to it, did I think? Because oh, there's a saying that families that laugh together stay together, but you're you're showing the other side of it. Oh, God, it sounds awful, but I don't remember. I don't remember much laughter growing up. It was all a bit hard knocks, you know. It was it was you know it was it was quite tough growing up and we didn't have ev everything and um mum and dad were really under pressure like every penny was saved but that's the uh, the immigrant story isn't it yeah, you've got absolutely. to work sort of two or three times as hard mm. in order to move forward and mm -hmm. uh, I, I i get that well was uh, it's funny because i talk about my father's uh, immigrant story because when my father was 17 he was already in the Second World War. He's 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 been dead six years now. But and you know then there was the uprising in Hungary when the Russians came in, and he had to escape, and everything. But my father had this strange um, joy, and he said, "I'm lucky," and he'd probably had one of the unluckiest lives of anybody he knew mm -hmm. because. He'd been through wars and uprisings and had to escape and, and yeah. you know, camps and things and refugee status and making a new life for himself. So how much do you think attitude is important to moving forward? Oh, absolutely huge. Huge. And I think people that practice things like gratitude and people that understand how fortunate they are, um, are, I think, much more inclined to be happier people and to laugh a little bit easier. And I'd like to think that's me. So I, when I look around, in fact, I'm not, I'm not religious. I, even though I was brought up with Sicilian Catholic parents, uh, I suppose I used to, used to be religious, used to believe there was a God, used to go to bed and say prayer every night. And I still do, but it's not necessary to a God or a what it's just to, to the, put it out there to the universe. And I'm always very, all I do is say thank you. Thank you for my amazing husband, my amazing family, my health, everything, my job, everything that I'm grateful for. And I think being appreciative and having that attitude is the one that paves the way for really good things, because I think people respond well to people who are positive, who have got high energy, who they like to be around, even in my work, whether that's my day job, which is nothing to do, by the way, with the political commentary, or whether it is in this new sort of showbiz glitz, glitzy political, you know, venture. Um, the people I want to surround myself with are those people that smile a bit easier, laugh a bit easier, um, and are, are happy to be vulnerable and open because I think that's where you make the really interesting connections. I, I love uh, that whole attitude of gratitude thing. Um, but I think it's very true. And, and the whole humorology project is around um, what are those differences that make a difference and why are people successful? And do you think that just that easy laughter, the people who laugh easiest, who laugh, can laugh at themselves, actually, is, is it important, you think, to mm. be able to laugh at yourself? I think so. And I think actually, this is interesting. So if you look at the different types of leadership, you've got leadership, like, for example, I've worked in businesses where the bosses have been, you know, not able to laugh at themselves, very serious, they rule with an iron fist, you know, there's no self deprecation there whatsoever. And I think that fosters an environment that's just not conducive to people being at ease, people being able to bring their true selves to work. And it's a bit driven by ego at the top. Whereas actually I've then worked for bosses and leaders who aren't like that, who can show vulnerability, 
who can laugh a little bit easier. I mean, you don't want a buffoon, of course. We've just had a buffoon who's just left number 10, of course. Um, but, but you want someone who can who can just smile at the funny things and who can just be a little bit vulnerable every now and then, who can make a little bit of a joke. And I think also work needs to be a place where you can have a laugh. The amount of time, the amount of hours that we spend at work, we, it needs to be an environment that you're happy in. And when I'm happy, I'm most productive. So that's why I think it's very important to have that type of leadership style. Oh, we've had um, William Haig, who was superb on the podcast, and he said he knew Thatcher and he said she was not funny. She didn't have a sense of humour. And mm -hmm. I just wonder if is that now going to be a hindrance? Because do modern day politicians have to have charisma, have to have a sense of humour in order to really connect with the public? Well, interestingly, I think this is where, because we are sliding more and more towards populism, I think this perception of a leader having to be funny or entertaining is becoming more and more of a thing because we're almost blending our entertainment and our politics. You look over the across the Atlantic to Trump, who was basically a you know TV star. He was a reality show TV star, and then you look over here and you know you see vox pops, for example, up and down the country of why people like. Boris Johnson or liked Boris Johnson and it was because they thought they could go for a pint with him or they liked his funny hair or they thought he was funny just in general and actually I've, I've said this before on my Twitter you know if, if you want to, a clown go to the circus. I, I love your Twitter feed and I encourage everybody to uh, to go and look at it because you do argue with passion uh, with humanity for social justice but Wit is really important in that mix because I think that's what gives you the cut through. Um, mm -hmm. And do you think that that people's attention spans are that much shorter now that they need a, a quick jibe, if you like? Teeny tiny. We, I've got it as well. I have to jewel through in these days because it's almost like one piece of content isn't enough. I need to have two pieces of content on the go or I can't just be doing my hair. I have to be listening to a podcast at the same time. If it's dead time, it's wasted time. So if you can deliver information and you can entertain at the same time, this is where you're winning. And this is where I think Boris Johnson, as much as I just despair at him, he had something because he could land a message through humour, through wit. And I think what we're seeing, sadly, if you look at the opposition, for example, you know, Kistama gets criticised because there's lack of charisma. People think he's dull. And it's a shame because leaders, it's fine if they're dull, but actually people are looking for someone to connect with them. And humour and wit is a great way for that, them to do that. Well, do you think that, that, that Labour is, is missing a trick by not actually putting the people who are, are more naturally charismatic and more naturally witty up uh, mm. but for for those positions i think time will tell i i'm still i think i've, I've been quite disappointed with with keir starmer i'm just desperate for the tory government to be out and um obviously it looks like labor are the people to replace keir starmer has let me down but i think that's more of a policy thing i i'm not let down so much by his charisma more of his you know not standing shoulder to shoulder with the unions, not talking a bit more open-mindedly about the single market and customs union, that sort of thing. That, and I suppose a bit of it is charisma because look, the British public clearly have an appetite for a leader with charisma. And it looks like it looks like Starmer is falling short there. So perhaps, I mean, I, who would be the Labour Party candidate who is funny? I think there are um, Jess Phillips, for instance, mm -hmm. is fun and funny. Uh, I've, I've met Jess and she's, you know, but is she too out there for uh, the general public? Uh, is, mm -hmm. is everybody scared that humour suddenly you'll go, you know, you know, they'll turn into Joe Lysett? Um, <laughs> if only. <laughs> would, but you see what I mean, that there's a fear factor there that mm. they don't want to go that far. I'm, I'm not. Honestly, I don't know. I'm not sure. I think Keir Starmer was chosen because he was uh, he promised that he would continue with the, 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 the Corbyn manifesto that was really popular and the 10 pledges. I think it was 10 pledges that he made. I don't know that humour or charisma came into it. I think it was more about 
manifesto type promises that said depending on how Keir Starmer does over the next two years maybe the Labour Party will need to start thinking about actually we need a leader that's going to connect on a more charismatic witty whatever basis and if that is the person if that that is what they're after no one massively springs to mind I actually think Angela Rayner has has got a good sense of humour but my concern is that she is too different she is she looks different she sounds different people aren't ready for her yet which is a shame I think she's great I think she's really strong I think when she's in PMQs and standing in for Keir Starmer she absolutely annihilates the opposition and she does so with humor by the way at times as well got a little bit of a a, you know a cheekiness to her which if it were Johnson if it were a white male you know like Cameron like Starmer that looks like the next type of leader that we're all familiar with i think she'd be in but the fact is she doesn't she's a woman she's a fiery redhead and she's got an accent and she's working class which i think are all pluses but other people just it's just too much change all at once well do you think as a country we we actually doff our caps too much to and you know because we've had 20 prime ministers that went to eaton for instance you know is there i just i despair at this but but i understand it we are so deferential as a country the reason i understand it paul is because i was the person that used to tug my forelock and doff my cap because i'm work very working class background and although for some reason on twitter people seem to think i'm not i get called a posh bird someone accused me of being the daughter of a baronet and a public school girl the other day i couldn't be further from that don't be wrong my accent has you know become (laughs) more posh if you want to call it that as i've got older but like you know absolutely not but when i was growing up probably till about my early 30s uh, bear one of 37 now losing count 37 now um i used to just assume that people who sounded posh were better than me were more intelligent were were, were just uh, it was their god-given right to be in these positions of power and only recently have i actually really realized i mean you just need to look at the like of, likes of jacob Brees mogg for example to learn that people are very much like Harry Enfield's character, Tim, nice but dim, completely dim. (laughs) And yet they are taught this manner of delivering information and this conviction, this confidence, where people like me are like, well, he sounds like he knows what he's doing. And we just believe it. And we just go, yeah, trust you, go and do it. I I agree. And and by the way, I think there is a correlation between uh, confidence and humour. I think that if, if you are given that confidence by going to Eton and Oxbridge and everything, I think you are therefore perceived as more funny, even mm. if you're not witty at all, by having the um, ability to stand there and, and expect the laugh. Mm-hmm. If you see what I mean, I think there's uh, because humour, I mean, I spent 10 years of my wo- life working the comedy store. Humour is about confidence as well it's about uh, being there and and expecting everybody to go with you because there's a saying in psychology that if you want anybody to go into any state you have to go into that state first Mm -hmm. so everything but um as i was listening to you talk i thought well is marina going to throw her hat into the political ring at any point (laughs) I think the nature of my Twitter ramblings um, probably preclude me from ever being allowed (laughs) to be a politician. Um, You say that, it didn't do Donald Trump any harm, did it? (sighs) This is true. Maybe I expect more from our politicians, though. I don't expect them to be quite as uh, direct, should we put it, or loose-lipped as I have been on my public platform. But uh, but I actually think, because I used to live in America, I think we're about five to seven years behind America. And you talked mm-hmm. earlier on about populism. But mm-hmm. suddenly, I think we might catch up and somebody who's actually saying what they think might become very, very, very in vogue, if you like. Mm-hmm. Uh, at yeah. the time. I think and I think we're seeing that with this rising popularity of people like Mick Lynch and Eddie Dempsey, because actually they're 
oh, I mean, we're, we're hearing things come out now which are a bit dodgy about the links to this, that and the other. But if you just take them at face value about what they've been talking about recently regarding the strikes, the reason for strikes, the inequality in this country and the, the need to redistribute wealth, they deliver it in such a way that's so direct. Also, I love the accents. I love their accents. And I think people need to learn that that a Cockney accent doesn't mean that you're like I don't, less intelligent or less deserving of the airtime or whatever than those with a posh accent. But what they've been doing is, is speaking without agenda, without fear, really directly. They're not afraid to deviate from a script, which sadly I think we see a lot with are uh, politicians even kiss Dharma, i think you see this like rigid st- sticking to us to a script and the reason they've become almost like hailed as heroes is because we're so starved of this straight talking approach now um so possibly there could be an appetite for someone just to come in and have that approach if it's me no i i, I can't i can't see it. honestly paul it's a nice thank you very complimentary thing to say but i i can't say this is all very new to me don't forget like I only this this sort of political commentator thing only really kicked off uh what in 2020 for me it's all very very new never say never Marina never say never (laughs) yeah it's interesting because I I'm I'm good friends with Paul Merton who is one of the most intelligent people I know I mean such a sharp brain but he's, I think, have I got news for you, has been on for 30 plus years. And that whole thing with Paul and Ian mm. is the classic British battle, isn't it? Between the working class and the perceived upper class. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I think that's a very good indicator of actually how a bright working class in inverted commas uh, person can be perceived so maybe there is going to become a time when it is valued i hope so and i hope i hope this deference to the posh whatever the upper class i hope it's something that disappears but you know it's 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 there with our monarchy right it starts with the monarchy filters down through you know our lords and our ladies and baronets and all the rest of it and then you know keeps us us prolies in our positions well, it does go back to the Frost Report, doesn't it? I don't know, you're far too young to remember, but John Cleese and um, uh, Ronnie Barker and Ronnie Corbett all standing in a mm, row. Mm, I do remember and, that. you know, um, uh, I'm upper class. I look mm. down on him. I'm middle class. I look down mm-hmm. on him, but I look up to him. And then Ronnie Corbett says the classic, I know my place. Yep. And I think that's what we see, by the way, and the, and the, red, the right wing rags as I call them perpetuate this because they keep us warring and battling amongst ourselves down here well this my neighbor over there has got a bit more than me or this immigrant over there why should they have more than me or this person on benefits and actually while we're here just quarreling amongst ourselves we're not we're distracted and we're not looking up here at what our politicians are doing with their corruption and with their rule breaking with their law breaking now with their subverting and shattering of our democracy and I think that's that's part of the plan. It's what I call in um, the, the magicians, um, you know, miss. Uh, what's it called? The magicians misdirection. Mm. It's it's constantly look over here. And I think that in a in a, a comedic way, Boris Johnson will talk about something like kippers. Mm-hmm. So the next day in the paper, everybody will talk about kippers or just recently kettles buy mm-hmm. a new kettle. Mm-hmm. Actually, maybe he just talks about things with K's because he thinks <laughs> K's are funny. Uh, um, but he's nailed it there because if you think about it, those are the those are the takeaways that you and I have had from those speeches: kippers, yeah. kettles, other things beginning with K. Um, the gaffes he makes, the Peppa Pig world, for example, we take something away from them. Whereas actually, if you think to other speeches that politicians give, we take nothing from them. So at least they're memorable. So he's, he's on to something there. And I think that that's why so many of our politicians, I think, make, the, and not even just politicians, even just people in business when they're giving business, like holding business meetings, it's almost like they assume this very professional stance and nothing can be funny and they just got to deliver details. But actually, I just think that's really hard for people to engage with. So even when I'm in my, again, in my day job, 
I try to, there's nothing wrong with injecting levity into it because actually that makes people relax a bit more. It makes people tune in in a different way. And actually, if you set the tone and go, this is just going to be a conversation between us. It doesn't have to be full of jargon. It can be, we can laugh at this or the fact that we did this and it didn't work. It was a flop. So let's try this instead. And I think this is, it just allows for a much more fluid conversation and for things to be remembered rather than like fact figure data bullet point blah, 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 which doesn't doesn't do it for me well by the way from a psychological perspective you're 100 percent right because it's what emotions and we go back to um uh when you um got fired up for politics in 2016 the reason that you got fired up was because of brexit but what you have to admit i well i have to admit as well is that they told a better story Mm-hmm. They, 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 they told a better emotional story uh, that engaged people. I mean, it and was a fairy tale. Let's, let's, of course uh, it was. But, <laughs> a fairy tale that never came true with unicorns and goblins and other mystical creatures. But they told a story, all right, and the Remain failed to do even that. Yeah. And, uh, and unfortunately, that's what wins. And, and what you were just uh, saying, it's very, we, you know, the trawl, your podcast is it's scrolling through Twitter, as I said before, so uh, we don't have to. But that will take a day of mm-hmm. that and then they'll introduce something else. So it's kind of like they've uh, taken humour and used it as a weapon. Uh, of mass distraction if you like yeah I mean it was Roger Rabbit actually so this probably goes back to when I was a kid Roger Rabbit who framed Roger Rabbit great film got it It as my first ever VHS videos as a gift for my birthday and there is a line in it so don't forget why was Jessica Rabbit with Roger Rabbit she was asked and she said he makes me laugh he makes me laugh and there's a bit where um he said Roger Rabbit said to the FBI agent, or whatever he is in it, the agent in it, he said, um, "Laughter is is a, is the most power, one of the most powerful things. Sometimes it's the only weapon you have." And I think that's so important. Roger Rabbit was on the money. Well, I, and I suppose that the, the fact that you can take something dark and make mm. light of it is what I would call a superpower, and also something that we need. Uh, to have a resilience um, that, to everything that's going on. I mean, do you find yourself, because you you go, you know, you get, you do so many tweets, you do mm-hmm. get so involved in this stuff. Do you think that, that, that you have to have some humour to keep the resilience in there, to keep going against all these uh, things that are, are hitting you every day? It's a coping mechanism. Genuinely, yeah. it's a coping mechanism because like many people have said if you don't laugh you will cry if you look at what's happened to this country if you look at the legacy for example of boris johnson the fact that we are more divided more impoverished more isolated more broken as an economy just everything is everything is worse now and it's it doesn't look like it's getting better i think this cost of living crisis what it's going to do to people what it's going to do to businesses schools hospitals pubs restaurants whatever everything is really bleak and then you've got everything with Brexit and oh anyway it basically it's not looking great that's what I guess we do in the troll we almost like look at what's going on and people's responses to it that just try and bring a little bit of levity to it now some of it you can't right you can't bring levity to the fact that children are going hungry or that people will freeze but you can almost <sighs> laugh in despair at the state of play um because otherwise what else can you do it's, it's too depressing it's too I, I don't think i'd be able to do this if all of my tweets and some of them are very serious just trying to break down what's happening but if all of it were very serious i don't think it'd be sustainable i think i'd be a very miserable person no yeah, we had um, john o'farrell on the podcast who's a, a brilliant writer and uh, and very involved in politics as well and he was originally on Have I Got News For You. He was on Spitting Image before that. And he says he despairs. And I wonder if somebody from the Twitter sphere who's really knows this stuff, he worries that by sharing a meme or a joke, part of us, and I think this, as a psychologist, I, I worry as well, 
part of us thinks we've done the job by sharing it rather than marching on the streets or or mm -hmm. doing something we well, we've we've done something to to break it and then we let go and yes yeah i think john's onto something there it's it, social media allows us room to vent and get things on our chest off our chest sorry and is this perhaps why we're not mobilizing we're not taking to the streets why were they able in an you know in an age of you know without social media without this ability to connect they were able to mobilize they were able to have these poll tax riots which changed the course of history now like you say we go on i put a tweet out there it gets a few thousand likes and then we move on to the next scandal but but there is an appetite to do it but you know what it is for me honestly Paul? i think it is everyone we've, we've done we've marched we've signed hundreds of petitions we i've spoken at protests uh, nothing has any impact anymore i mean you have to just look to the heart of government and look at some of the the law breaking the rule breaking the breaking of ministerial code for example the uh just you know the the fact that there's this good chap's guide of government that is completely just has been annihilated basically writing rewriting of rules nothing matters anymore so people have lost faith that their action is going to do anything so what do we do we take to twitter we have a moan, a whinge, a joke, and we get through it. Yeah, but is that it then? That uh, are we going to? Uh, because uh, have have we been nullified on some level by uh, doing this and going? Look at us. We're we're you know thousands of us have liked this tweet. And you know what it is as well, Paul. We've we've only got so much capacity for this stuff. You know, everyone's got their lives they're, they're dealing with. They're dealing with their bills, their kids, their jobs, wanting to watch Coronation Street, wanting to watch their Netflix series. They can only take on so much. And this is part of, don't forget, this was Johnson's strategy, probably inspired by, um, what's his name? The guy, uh, Bannon, who said... Steve was, Bannon. Steve Bannon, who said, flood the zone with shit. I hope that's okay to say on the podcast. Um, which is a great strategy because when there's so much stuff going on, it's hard to know what to turn your attention to because if you focus too much on this, then before you know it, the next scandal has started, um, uh, you know, uh, playing out. And Boris Johnson was interviewed on this. An interview surfaced actually a few months ago. I, I, I shared it myself that he said his strategy when he became leader would be to make so many gaffes that basically the media wouldn't know what to focus on and while they're all like in chaos not knowing what to do he would I, I quote drop depth charges I think that was the term he used so he could just go off and do what he needed to do and essentially that's what he's done well it's the same I mean Steve Bannon advised Trump Steve mm. Bannon advised Orban in Hungary Steve Bannon was said to but I don't want to get in into to have advised uh, some people in the Tory party. I don't know if it was Boris Johnson, mm -hmm. but it, it's the same uh, thing. And it's, I hate to use the word clever, but it's a clever strategy if you don't, if you just want to muddy the waters. Yeah, it's a and manipulative strategy. A manipulative is a better word. I think clever gives it too much credit. It's very yes. manipulative. And sadly, what we've learnt is it's we as, as a British public can be very easily manipulated. Yeah, gosh. It's like an we've... abusive relationship though, isn't it? If you think about it, it's like we can get laughed into bed by this guy with funny hair and, uh, you know, we think he's going to be, you know, uh, uh, good for a pint. And then he will lie to us and lie to us. And we've actually gone, we you know, he lies. It's fine. It's just what he does. And we're just okay with that now. And I just think it's bananas that as a country, we've come to accept that that's OK from our politicians. So do you think it's uh, like Stockholm syndrome? We've 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 started to learn to love that. Yeah. Yeah. It's quite sad, really, isn't it? And terrifying. Gosh. Mm. Well, let's lighten it up on the humorology <laughs> podcast. Good. This is a humorology podcast, I'm so sorry. I've taken the tone down. <laughs> no, it's wonderful. I love it. <laughs> Exactly. And another thing you've got to laugh about, but what are we doing to ourselves as a country? I do often think, what must other countries think when they look at us? We impose economic sanctions on ourselves. We, we pump shit into our own waters. We have the highest 
some of the highest taxes, the highest transport costs, the highest childcare costs. We sign trade deals with other countries that ruin our own industries, fishing, farming. What must people think of us? Yeah, it's going well, isn't it? It's going fabulously. <laughs> You're right, we do have to laugh. Gosh, oh, well, that's cheered me up no end. Thanks, Maureen. Mm, you're uh, welcome. Well, I did say I think there is a gap in the market for a badge or something you can wear if you're travelling on the continent or indeed anywhere in the world that says, I'm not one of those morons that voted Brexit <laughs> or I'm not one of those idiots that voted Tory. Right? I think there should be something you can use or have. Because I was in France recently and I'm, I don't want them to hear my accent and assume I'm some you know, Brexit voting moron. Yeah, I was uh, I I was in Budapest and I, I I nearly got punched for being an English um uh, football hooligan first of all, <laughs> which as you can see I look like a, a football hooligan because uh, <laughs> and I had to I had to go up to a very big bloke and say I'm Scottish and Hungarian. Mm. Mm. What were you and doing it, to make him think that, Paul? I don't know. He just heard uh, that me and my son and my um, brother who lives in Hungary talking and uh, we were talking about football and nice. it was, you know, and he just automatically made this leap. He'd had mm -hmm. a couple of drinks at the same mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. So what makes you laugh, Marina? What makes me laugh? Oh, I, I think I, I do love British humour. I do love sort of very dry, witty people, sarcasm, that type of thing. When I was younger, it was your typical sort of slapstick stuff. I used to love love a bit of, you know, Youth in Framed, Beatles about, that type of thing. Faulty Towers, Only Fools and Horses still makes me laugh now. My favourite Only Fools, and yeah, well, there's that bit. <laughs> My favourite, though, episode of Only Fools and Horses is... Um, Tony, what's the guy, the entertainer, and he can't pronounce his R's when he's singing on stage. Really, uh, the, yeah, um, and he does crying. <laughs> oh, <who> are you? <laughs> that is my favourite yeah. episode. Every time I see that, it makes me laugh. I think it's yeah, really it's good. it's and it's an Italian name, isn't it? It's Tony. Sort of Tony thing. Um, yeah. Oh, oh. But, oh, he's, well, but even though that's pretty, you know, when he takes off the clothes and he's just got that one triangle of deep tan and he's got the wig and he's got the medallion and it's brilliant, actually. No, it's a brilliant. great, great episode, a mm. great, great episode. And so now we've talked, you're on the borders of politics all the time listening to it and we talked about certain people not being funny, but do you think everybody has the potential to be funny? I think they do if they have the confidence, like you say, because I think it requires a degree of confidence to be funny because you're putting yourself out there not to be funny and to put out a joke and not be laughed at, a bit like my uh, my cousin's husband. He's got a hit rate of about, I'd say, 10%. He puts out 10 jokes, maybe one more, one more like land. But actually, he's quite, and it's quite nice to be in his company because at least you know they're coming, even if they're not that funny all the time. Even the attempt is funny. But you've got to have confidence to do that because if a joke, does, joke doesn't land, it can be quite orcs. Um, but also, I think you need to be in a good, a good place mentally to be able to laugh a bit easier. I, I know, for example, if you're having a bad day, and I watched that series of Only Fools and Horses that I mentioned, it's harder to laugh than if I've had a good day and I watched that episode of Only Fools and Horses. Can it actually change you, though? I mean, do you put it on as, in inverted commas, therapy? So, you know, the laughter therapy that you actually put something that you know is guaranteed to, to shift your state? Do you know what? If I had more time, I probably would have something that I would turn to for laughter therapy. But at the moment, every second, every minute is of the essence. So sadly, I don't have that luxury. Well, I, I prescribe the Humorology podcast, mm. three times a week. <laughs> Noted. <laughs> Trust me, I'm a doctor. <laughs> um, so if I asked you to write, because you work in business, you've worked in the city, um, thing, and if I asked you to write a business case for humour, mm. i.e. why should humour be valued in business, or what would you include in that business case? In a business case, you're trying to you're trying to convince people that it's worth worth investment, right? There's going to be a return on investment. And what I would say is that humor, 
will give you the best return because you will be able to take people on a journey with you. They'll be able to um, buy into whatever it is you're trying to do with them, whether it's a new uh, project or whatever. Um, and I also think it means people will be receptive, whether that's your stakeholders or even the people you are delivering the product to, your customers, for example. So I would say there's absolutely a business case for it. Um, but if it fits, like, I, the, there's, there's nothing worse sometimes than seeing someone try to be funny. Uh, like, you know, look, you look at David Brent as a character in The Office, right? An absolutely stellar character. Try desperately to be funny at moments when it wasn't appropriate. When he, he, he couldn't read the room. The room's not ready for a joke or they're not warm to him. So then it's never going to land. So I think it just, it, there's, there's, a, there's an, almost like a set of ingredients. The, the timing needs to be right for humour. And I think that's down to emotional intelligence to understand when is the right time to be funny. Do you, do you think that includes listening? I mean, and I'm not just talking with the ears, I'm talking with the eyes. You talk, that's what I think emotional intelligence is, is reading the person, reading the room, as you said. Absolutely. And I think not enough people listen. I mean, my husband would probably say I'm terrible at listening. <laughs> I, uh, my husband is a, a real thinker and he, he's very analytical. And sometimes I, while waiting for him to come, reach his conclusions, I sort of jump in and I finish his sentences for him, which he finds really irritating. Um, I, don't, I, I don't know. I, I think emotional intelligence is, is really important. And yes, use your, your, use your ears in the ratio that you were given them. You've been given two ears and one mouth. Use them in that ratio. I think we might have shared the same grandmother. Yeah. <laughs> My grandmother said exactly the same to me. God gave you two ears and one mouth in that ratio for a reason. And look at both of us. How much do we both talk? I know, I know. We didn't listen. We didn't pay attention. Sorry, Nonna. <laughs> Marina, we've reached a part of the show which we like to call quick fire questions. Sounds you good. can't wait, can you? No, it's brilliant. <laughs> quick fire questions. Who is the funniest business person that you've met? Uh, do you know what I would say? So actually, I back in the day, in 2006, I did a season working abroad for Club 1830. Now, yes. Now, I wasn't a holiday rep, I think I need to caveat, but I was the office girl in Zanti. And my boss and the director of the resort at the time was a guy called, we called him Screech. And he was one of the best bosses I have, I've had brilliant leadership style but also one of the funniest men I have ever met and I'm still in contact with him now many many years later so for, for me he would be the ultimate in fact he's a perfect example of a boss who was respected who was firm that everyone wanted to do really well for work really hard for because he was such fun to be around and his really, name was really Screech Screech he was known as Screech but Steve Alice is his name yes oh. Okay, I was, I was thinking that's a perfect comedy name. Well, he used to look like Screech from Saved by the Bell. That's how he got oh, his, yeah, that's okay. how he got his name. Well, uh, Club 1830, and I don't know if we could actually use this gag anymore because uh, it was so of its time, but their advertising campaigns were legendary. And uh, there was an advertising campaign in London which just had a huge billboard which just had the words spend two weeks on some bloke's boat. <laughs> Which Brilliant. for those of us who have, don't know Cockney rhyming slang, go mm, and look it up. Mm, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Joe, it's a shame. Their bar crawls and their cabarets and their boat parties were legendary. Legendary. Yeah, I never got to go. So, no, and uh, I'm so glad that they're not around anymore because I have, I'm the mother of a son now and I would want him going nowhere near that type of holiday. <laughs> well, I have a 21-year-old son, so if there were, I'm pretty sure he'd be Good glad. <laughs> <laughs> what book makes you laugh? This is a really lame one, but I used to love the Garfield books. You know, the little Garfield right? yes. books? Just thought, again, really dry. And I loved Garfield's character. And he was just such a miserable, a bit like Jack D, but in the cat world, miserable, sort of hilarious, dry, sort of uh, 
thinking, by the way. He was never talking. He was always thinking. But I used to love those books as a kid and I collected them. I think that shows you that now I don't read funny books. I only read very serious books. If you look at the stash on my bedside table, it's all about um, why we get the worst politicians and the death of democracy and <laughs> uh, the tyranny of merit. So nothing particularly humorous in my reading collection right now. Maybe I need to change that, Paul. T t time for some Garfield. Yeah, I think so. I'll get them back. I'll go to mum and dad's house and I'll pick them up from my shelf. What film makes you laugh? Um, the Wedding Singer, I really liked. I loved, um, is it John, what's his name? John Buscemi? Who's the character? Who's the it's, actor? It's who, yeah, yeah, I think he, his character in that is absolutely brilliant. Uh, oh, what else? I can't think now. Again, I don't... I, I need, to, I need to start doing more things with levity in them because I think I'm becoming well, far too serious. You do have a small child as well. This is true. And a this job and uh, have taken Twitter by storm and, and a I'm podcast and one. TV. I've got another one due in six weeks, Paul. A podcast or a child? <laughs> a, po a, po a child. I've got another child. The, the next podcast is out next week. Thank you. Thank you very much. So it's oh. all go. Oh, that's wonderful. And, yeah. and do we know what's what's coming or is it a surprise? We do. So I've got a little boy who is 21 months and this is a oh. little girl. So I've got the full compliment. Oh, oh fantastic. I know. Oh, please tell me that's a humorology podcast exclusive. It, the <laughs> fact that it's the girl is actually not the fact that I'm having a baby, but yes, it is. Oh, well, congratulations. That's lovely Thanks. news. That's oh, really bitchy. sweet. Oh, mm. that's really... Um, we're going to take a complete shift to the other side now. And, and I'm going to ask a question that I ask all my guests, which is what's not funny? <sighs> what's not funny, I think, is when uh, I think there's certain times people like, and don't get me wrong, he can be funny. But if you look at people like Frankie Boyle, who sometimes push a little bit too far in, an, in a certain direction, and Ricky Gervais has actually been guilty of this as well and I'm a big fan of Ricky Gervais I've been to see him a few times the same as Jimmy Carr they've all got the potential to just go a few too many inches below the belt and it's more of a shock than a than a laugh and so I think that that's where the, I think there are certain things you just don't talk about when it's you know disabilities or if we sort of just like we saw at the um what was the it was the Oscars where we saw Chris it Chris Rock. Rock, yeah, take the piss out of alopecia. For me, I think it's absolutely fine to take the piss out of people for choices they make, for their behaviour, things that they have control over. I don't know that it's funny to take the piss out of people for things that they don't have in their control, like disabilities or like hair loss, or, for example, or weight, things like that, just being, or their appearance. This is actually thing on Twitter I really don't like is that if I go at someone like a Tory MP, even Boris Johnson, whoever, I never comment on their appearance. I think there's just certain things that are off limits. There is enough to go on there to insult without having to touch upon someone's appearance. So I think things like that are probably just not that funny. Yeah, I, I mean, coming from a comedy background, my, my only issue with that is this is a personal thing and we we can talk about punching up punching down which i think is what you're talking about but who's going to police this stuff i mean i i would argue that you have to allow this of course or, um, it's, a, it's a supply and demand thing right so but, and it's also a personal opinion which is what the question's about is personally yeah. you find those things slightly yeah. Difficult. And this is what and this is what's wonderful, right? I don't, I not that I find them difficult. I just don't enjoy them particularly. So what do oh. I do? I don't watch them. I don't go to see there Frankie Boyle, although I think he's actually toned himself down, and I quite like sometimes his takedowns of the Tory party. I won't go and see people like that if I think they're a bit too. It's a bit like, I mean, obviously Jim Davidson is is not even that funny, but I wouldn't go and see him because of certain. I just think his jokes are shit, and also he's a right wing tosspot. So I, uh, you know. That, I've got the choice. I'm not saying he should be cancelled at all. And in fact, I don't like this cancel culture because it flies in the face of, of, of free speech. And I, if we're going to say, if we're going to really be bastions of free speech, it needs to be free for people that we think are abhorrent as well as those that we think are on side. Well, I, I couldn't agree more. And it's, I mean, I don't mind when people say personally, I don't like this. 
you know but uh, once we get into somebody is in charge of deciding what we can and cannot hear then we're in a very very tricky situation which is the tory party now we've now got this person i think they've just put up um given a role to someone just last week who is now policing who can and can't speak at universities is that really I need to do? yeah who can and can't be platformed at universities um falls to a new recruit so it, yeah free speech when it suits basically yeah well i think that's really what's not funny is people who actually try and get in the way of free speech mm. mm-hmm. yeah, that that's a personal thing what word makes you laugh marina oh gosh do, do other people feel on the spot when you ask these questions or just me no it's fine it's just you know it, you don't even have to answer it it's just like what what you know what with a, a 21 year month old uh, child mm. soon the word poo is going to make you laugh <laughs> quite a lot uh he started being quite funny but he uses a word that's not funny in a funny way bear in mind he is 20 months old he's only just grasping a few words yeah he's managed to it's almost like he's taking the piss out of me when he does this he's learned how to say don't back to me and he goes don't don't as if he's just <laughs> mocking me and then he goes and does what i tell him not to do anyway like drop his porridge on the floor don't don't <laughs> mummy don't <laughs> so that's rather funny well you, well, do you know that Oh, no, no, there you go. The word don't. You're the first person ever to choose the word don't. But I will tell you an interesting, well, I hope it's interesting fact about don't, because don't in psychological terms is a negation. And when you tell children um, don't drop your porridge on the floor, they hear drop your for- porridge on the floor and then they d- hear don't. Oh, goodness. Because, what do I say to him then? What's the word? Like, no, what's the keep your porridge in your bowl. You see what I mean? It's about yeah. turning that around and uh, and everything. So in, in psychological terms, it's called a negation that you can't negate. And by the way, you know, if you're if you're going in to negotiate with your boss, don't think about giving me a, a huge rise, mm. you know, actually works in the in, in that way as well. Oh, wow. OK. Me and you might have to have a catch up afterwards about just about parenting. <laughs> <laughs> OK. A one to one session. What sound makes you laugh? Uh, <laughs> this is so juvenile but when my little one breaks wind we but we laugh very much because he finds it so funny and so I find it funny but um don't enjoy it when adults do it my, my, my brother is very free and loose with it he, you know he's three years older than me he's a 40 something and he finds it hilarious when he does it around the table I'm like that's not you know not when we're eating but when my son does it he's 20 months 21 months and you know cute that's that's fine yeah, and uh, and it's uh, it's the funniest thing in the world to a child, yeah. and then when they laugh, it's just you know music, you're angry. It? Oh, it's yeah. music, and you know, and and that's probably the sound as well that makes uh, yeah. in tandem with with the farts. But farts, yeah. pretty much everybody thinks <laughs> we never grow out of that, do we? <laughs> no, farts are always funny. Although we don't uh, in my marriage, we don't do that in front of each other in our marriage. Retain well, an air of mystery. <laughs> good idea. <laughs> yeah, definitely a good idea. Mm. So um, would you rather be considered clever or funny? Does it have to be an either or? Oh, no, there are no rules on the Humorology podcast. Oh, because you don't just want to be funny, but like a, a douchebag. So if I had to pick one, I'd say clever. Well. Yeah. But then mm. you, you see most people, well, just about all people. I've never met uh, a comedian who isn't also clever. No, you have enough. to be. I think you yeah. have to be. Yeah. So, so I, it's kind of a trick question, really, mm. isn't it? Mm. Yeah. But, I, but if you can be funny, you're pretty much guaranteed that you're 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 firing some really good neurons in your brain. Yeah. Um, I, because I, to the quick, quick-witted people for me. There's a real attractiveness about it. There's a like humor, you know, the ability to laugh, to laugh people into bed. It's because it is so attractive. There is, you're right. There is an intelligence thing there, the quick witted thing. It's being able to deliver to, to captivate people, um, and to make someone laugh is a real, it's a, it's a powerful thing. Well, what you're doing is you're, you're making them do an involuntary act. 
-hmm. So that's actually quite telling, isn't it? Because then if you think in the biological and biological terms of biological imperative, aren't you going to choose somebody who is um, has uh, superpowers, if you like? Yeah, I have Paul in back in the day. I have fancied some appalling looking men who were just very funny, very funny, but just God, nothing to look at at all. Probably it feels harsh, but you know, a one or two on the scale. I really fancied them because they were funny. Mind well, you, I don't, think, I don't think women have that in reverse, do they? No. No, no I don't. Well, no, no, it's because men are very, very thin skinned. <laughs> Shallow is the word. Shallow is the word <laughs> I'm looking for. But thank you. Thank you for pointing it out as well. <laughs> um, just, just so we're clear, not all men. Oh, not yeah. all hashtag or well, not as <laughs> asterisk not all men <laughs> and finally marina desert island gags you can only take one joke with you to a desert island what is it i've got i've got one but again it's so juvenile and it's from my youth but it's just one that sticks in my head <laughs> and it's probably not funny at all but um the number naught and the number eight are walking down the street and the number naught turns to number eight and says, why are you wearing your belt so tight? <laughs> I just, don't know why. I loved that one since I was a kid. Just cute and just Oh, it innocent. is cute. And I actually didn't see it coming. I'd never heard that gag. And I, I think I've go. heard most of them. Um, oh, Marina Perkis, thank you so much for being a wonderful guest with a great gag on the Humorology podcast. Thank you for having me on, Paul. The Humorology podcast was hosted by Paul Barros. Produced by David Rose. Music by Steve Hayworth. Creative direction by Les Hughes. And additional research by Helen Sykes. Please remember to subscribe, like and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. This has been a Big Sky production.